No, they're way too talented for that, and so is he. As much as I love his old stuff, I think it would be a disappointment if he just kept doing that. What's up, everybody? I am Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today I'm back with another review. I did one of these of the new Architects song a couple weeks ago. Seemed like people liked it, so I thought I would try another one, this time of the new Ghost Main album, Anti-Icon which seems to be his breakthrough album. It just kind of feels like this is gonna be the thing that takes him from here to here. And I think it puts him in the same conversation as bands like Bring Me The Horizon, who have really transcended any particular genre and can do whatever they want. But that said, I would say that it's not my personal favorite thing in his discography, and I will explain why in this video. But before I get into it, I wanted to mention the Punk Rock NBA newsletter for anybody that hasn't signed up for it. It's an email that I send out every week with a link to any content I put out on this channel, on my second channel, on the podcast, any like interviews or press appearances I might have done. No ads, no spam, no nothing like that. I will never share or sell your email address. It's just a weekly email. So if that sounds interesting, you can sign up at the link in the description. And with that out of the way, let's get into this review. So for anybody who's not familiar with Ghost Man, or as they called him on a podcast I listened to a couple years ago, Ghost Man, he is known as one of the most popular alternative rappers, I guess you would say. He's kind of associated with the same genre as like Suicide Boys and Fat Nick and Lil Peep. But the truth is that he hasn't been a rapper for a long time. He's really transcended that. Like I said, I think he's transcended genre in general. And this album is a great example of that. I would call it like 60% industrial, 30% metal, and maybe 10% rap. And that may come as a surprise to some people who maybe haven't listened to him a couple years, but if you've been paying attention, it was clear that this is where he was headed years ago. I first heard him when I saw the video of him doing the live version of Venom. And I was like, who the fuck is this kid with like long hair and a deicide shirt rapping like he's the world's biggest 3-6 Mafia fan? Like, what the fuck is this? After I saw that video for Venom where he's wearing the deicide shirt, I looked a little bit deeper. I found out he used to be in a hardcore band. He had a song called Euronymous. And I was like, all right, this guy is not just wearing a deicide shirt because he got it at the thrift store and it looks cool. He's obviously into this shit. He wasn't the very first to do that style, but he was definitely early. I mean, going back to like 2015. I would say that his verse in Thousand Rounds with Puya is the single best verse in all of like alternative rap. Is that good? The rest of the song, not great, I don't love Puya, but his verse is fucking amazing. I think Venom is one of the genre defining songs of alternative rap, along with probably Witchblades by Lil Peep and Lil Tracy and Paris by Suicide Boys. So he's one of maybe not like the founding fathers of this, but he's been there for a very long time and he's always been at the very top of the food chain creatively. He is a very smart guy. And it just seems like he's always been one or two steps ahead of everybody else. But he really didn't get a lot of recognition from the rock scene. He was kind of lumped in as an emo rapper or maybe with the trap metal guys, although I don't think he's either one of those things, but whatever. Regardless of that, he kept moving in more of a rock kind of direction. He put together a live band, which more and more people are doing now. But again, he was very early to this. He got like Kale from Twitching Tongues and Down Presser and Misery on drums. He got Parvo as his DJ, who was also like a Texas hardcore guy. The first big like turning point there to me was in 2018, he put out an album called Noise, where he really started to incorporate a lot of the industrial stuff. And then he did an EP called Fear Network, I think in 2019, which pretty much sounds like nails. He also did like a lo-fi black metal kind of project. And so it became very obvious that his creative vision for where he wanted to take himself was not in like the sad boy 3-6 Mafia emo rap kind of direction. And that's when I noticed people kind of start to come around to him. Rock outlets like Kerrang! and Loudwire and Revolver started writing about him, finally. Now I would say he is completely accepted and I think that this album is only gonna continue that. Like I said, even though he's known as a rapper, 
If you listen to this album, I think you'd have a very hard time calling it rap. To me, the obvious comparison is Nine Inch Nails, Marilyn Manson, all that like 90s industrial kind of stuff that would have some metallic guitars here and there. And so that's why I say that on the one hand, I recognize that this is a great album and I respect what he's done creatively. But on the other hand, it's why it's also not my favorite one of his releases because really what it comes down to is I'm more of a rap guy than an industrial guy. It's interesting to me that people ask me a lot of questions or leave comments sort of implying that I'm a metal guy. And I certainly listen to a lot of metal and I grew up on a lot of that stuff. But really the first kind of music that I ever listened to when I was like nine years old was rap. I listened to that before I knew what metal or punk or hardcore was. I still listen to rap all the time. Like that's the one kind of music that I never stopped listening to. And that's why I responded so much to that like 2015 to 2017 cloud rap kind of stuff. Cause it sounded like cool, dark, old school, like Memphis kind of rap, but it was made by like hardcore dudes. I feel like it was like tailor made for me. And there's really only one song like that on this record. It's called a hell rap. The rest of them range from like Nine Inch Nails Industrial. You've taken all my pain away and gave me shiny chains. To a couple of like slow kind of droney interludes. So I would say that I'm probably more likely to listen to his older stuff personally, but I totally get why he did this. I mean, like Bring Me the Horizon, I think they were a very good deathcore band, but what are they gonna do? Keep playing deathcore forever? They're gonna keep making Count Your Blessings for another 15 years? For people that talented, that's just stupid. That's a waste of their potential. They checked that box, they know they can do it. Now it's on to the next thing. Same with AFI, are they gonna keep making like 90s skate punk albums forever? No, they're way too talented for that and so is he. As much as I love his old stuff, I think it would be a disappointment if he just kept doing that. So I totally support and respect where he went with this album. Just the same as I don't like everything that Bring Me the Horizon did, but I understand it and I respect it and I support it. And just like it takes the rest of the scene one or two or three years to catch up to Bring Me the Horizon and copy what they did, I expect to see the same thing happen with Ghostmane. And it's just another example, the larger trend of a lot of the people that started out kind of in the same cohort as he did. People like Lil Lotus, Cold Heart, Fish Nark, going back to their roots and doing something that is more rock influenced. Or like in Lil Lotus's case, he actually started a whole new band called If I Die First that sounds like 2004 Mall Screamo, and it's great. These guys are all way too talented to just stay frozen in time. And all those old songs are still there. We can all listen to them whenever we want. So I support them for moving forward creatively. I think this is a great album. It's gonna do great things for his career. I mean, I'm absolutely amazed at how far he's come. He's right now at 3.6 million listeners on Spotify. This album was in like the top 10 album debuts that week on Spotify. There's a billboard for it in like Times Square. A year ago, I saw him sell out like a 1500 person venue. I think like Harm's Way was the direct support on that. So the crowd was like everyone from like hardcore dudes to like weird industrial type people with the fishnets and the vinyl stuff to like hype beast rap kids to like straight up metal dudes. It was super cool to see him bring all those different things together in the crowd, just like he's done with his music. And I think that's awesome. If there's gonna be anybody that's the breakout representative of that scene, it seems like he is poised to be that person, especially with this album. So at the end of the day, I would give this album a solid A. I think it's great. I personally will probably still listen to his older stuff, but I love what he's doing here. And I'm very excited to see what's next for the ghost man, as they call them on that podcast. When you hear that wooden block, you know it's still the ghost. All right, my friends, that does it for this review of Ghost Mane's album, Anti-Icon. Let me know what you think in the comments about this album and about me doing more reviews like this. This one was fun. If you haven't signed up for the Punk Rock NBA newsletter, you can do that at the link in the description. And as always, I wanna thank everyone who supports us on Patreon. And I'm genuinely, sincerely grateful for everybody who supports over there. You are the reason we're able to do the podcast, so thank you very much for that. And if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, you can do that at the link in the description as well. And with that, I'm gonna sign off for now, but I will see you next time.